this time. If something goes wrong, you'll be one of the bodies inside it next. I'll put his umbilical, pull it, pull it. What the hell are we gonna do? It was so powerful. If you were to fall there, you'd be dead. There's no easy way out in the metal hall. It was very much the focus to get up there, no matter what. This is the altitude. <laughs> he was hurting. Off the West African coast, the waters are busy with ships of every kind at the mercy of the unforgiving Atlantic. A sudden storm off the Niger River Delta capsizes a tugboat 20 miles from shore. Vessels race to the Mayday call, but the tug has sunk. There are 12 crew on board. All are presumed dead. Within hours of the tragedy, divers are requested. We got the call to basically mobilize and assist with the operation. Colby Warrett runs a commercial diving team, trained to operate on the ocean floor. Nico van Herden is his lead diver. They asked us if we can, are willing to recover the bodies. Sailing to the upside down wreck of tugboat Jaskin 4 and preparing to dive takes two full days. The divers are lowered 100 feet in a diving bell to find and recover 12 crew members. I've never had any training when it comes to recovering dead bodies. The JASCON 4 was the first time I ever experienced something like that in my life. I think everybody was preparing themselves really for what we're going to do. All right, just make sure all our gas is OK, OK? Guys, I'm going to get the basket down to the short mark again, OK? No need to worry, it's clear from your umbilicals, good position. Deep water diving makes normal air toxic to breathe, so Nico and second diver Daryl breathe a helium oxygen mixture. The helium changes their voices. Get a hammer ready, please, Daryl, and one of those wedges to go in between the door. The first job is to find a way inside the vessel. The security situation in Nigeria with piracy and kidnappings, they lock themselves internally. They call a lockdown procedure to stop them being boarded by pirates. In the control room above, Colby watches the murky picture from Nico's helmet camera. The water is thick with silt from the Niger River. Get the wedge and knock the hinge. I'm trying to break steel over. Just keep beating it, it'll, it'll break, it has to. Yeah. Go for it, just f*** it up. <laughs> Took me about two and a half hours to break one of those doors down. Let's go in there. Okay, right down. <laughs> <What the? sighs> There go, we found the captain. The first thing I found was the captain. The captain was obviously deceased. When I saw his face, I knew he was actually in another vessel that I worked on. I didn't know him personally, but I knew the, the, the I knew his face. You're right, Nika. Yeah. Well done, that's a good job, Rick. Okay, we're getting back inside. That's my vehicle. All right, up on his umbilical. He's coming back to the door. Coming up. All right. Colby guides Nico back inside to look for 11 more bodies. Always be away with your umbilical in places, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nico's umbilical delivers his breathing gas. His life depends on it. You dislodge the cupboard or a fridge or something, and it falls on your umbilical. It might you might get trapped inside there, and then that could be a very very dangerous situation. Oh, that's a good sign. Eh? Why? There's a shoe. We found shoes. It's looking like a good sign. Copy that. 
Are we looking in, Nico? Nothing so far, no. Okay, we did swim around. We cleared the captain's cabin, there's nothing in there. Alright, so it's nothing. Nothing, I can't find anywhere inside there. Okay. It happened 5 o'clock in the morning, so we're still sleeping. To search the crew's cabins, Nico must go to the next deck, deeper into the confusing upside-down wreck. All right, looks like we're gonna go down the stairs. Yeah, right. It's not safe, okay? Just be a little bit more vigilant, right? All right, all right. I'm thinking, Ish, that's a worry for me because it's umbilical, you, you don't know what kind of hazards. The visibility is poor. Took us a little further than what we'd normally do, you know. Bit of a, out of our comfort zone. Now, let's get down to the next level. Where are we going next? Go around the corner. The railings will all be above you. Just not yeah. very cool. I don't know why I did it. Yeah, just talk to me and I'll help you, eh? You've gone into this vessel and everything's upside down. You know, I'm just going around so many corners and bends. I was very nervous. I don't want to get stuck. How's your umbilical? It's not going to get trapped in any of those corners. Just be aware. You couldn't see anything, so you feel where you are. You're right, Nika. I just want to get myself orientated. No problem. Get yourself orientated. In the back of your head, you've got that thing. If something goes wrong, you'll be one of the bodies inside it. They'll come look for you next. Have you come into the next deck? Yeah, I'm at the top of the stairs now. I'm onto the main deck level now. You should be walking on the ceiling, yeah? Right. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Okay, keep him there. Keep him there. Hold him there. Okay, just keep him there. Unbelievable. This is unreal. Just, just, just keep him there and keep him calm. Okay. <laughs> This man has survived in a pocket of trapped air 100 feet deep on the ocean floor for three days. All right, just um, just reassure him, pat him on the shoulder. Poor man. I think I was a bit in shock. I was frozen there for a, for a minute or two. Just tell him to relax. We are going to help him. Keep reassuring him all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just relax, my friend. Relax. Give him a thumbs up, OK? Ask him if there's anybody out. Is there anyone out? Open your hands like this. Nobody. Only you. Nobody. Run. Nothing. He said, he said, he said he had some people for a long time, yeah. but now it's been quiet for a long time. Okay. I wasn't expecting anyone to be alive. There's no protocol for any of this. Just change the whole scenario. All right, what are we going to do? Is he struggling to breathe? Yeah, think? it looks like it, eh? You should make a call to one of the diving doctors and just start to ask him. Breathing the same air for three days, vital oxygen has been exchanged for carbon dioxide. This man is being suffocated by the same air pocket that's kept him alive. I don't want to rush in blindly with anything. We gotta have a hundred percent. Just gotta keep him alive. He was really, really struggling, and I, to be honest, another hour, two hours, he would have been, yeah. We gotta try and find a way how we're gonna get him to the surface. What are we gonna do? Nico, Colby, and the team have no experience or training for a deep sea rescue. So he's CO2 is bad, then we need to get an airline in there. Some clean air, if you know what I mean. That could be a problem, copy. 
You guys need to really f***ing brainstorm this out because he's suffering from CO2. I don't know what we're gonna do. He's alive, he's alive. Okay, keep him there, keep him there. I wasn't expecting anyone to be alive. What the hell are we going to do? A survivor has been found after three days trapped in a shipwreck, 100 feet below the surface. The dive team came to recover dead bodies, but now they need to get this man out alive. Told me you cannot do what you're doing. What did the doctor say? What are we going to do? Yes. Behind the scenes, a team of doctors approve a plan, but it's risky. Yeah, Roger. All right, what we're gonna probably do, guys, you all listening? We're gonna get the standby from the bell. So we're gonna be taking a standby uh, a harness, okay, as well as the bandmaster and the umbilical, okay? And we're gonna take it into the wreck and go and get him, okay? And he's gonna come into set, okay? All right? We'll slowly walk him out. Daryl, you're gonna have to tender both umbilicals, bringing him back to the bell, okay? The bell is equipped with a third helmet and umbilical for the bellman to use in an emergency. Colby's plan is to bring the equipment into the wreck and use it to rescue the survivor. If something goes wrong, there is no plan B. Taking the bellman's equipment, we're making ourselves more vulnerable. Me and Daryl, because if something happens to us, then the bellman can't come rescue us. Right, Nico, we're bringing you the bellman's harness, yeah? Stay here. I'm going out. I'll come back. Okay, stay here. I'm just there alone. I know I'm close to death. I have been there for days, so I don't know what will happen. We don't want to spend too much away from him, yeah? Let's get back in there. Okay, my friend. I can see the best word is ever done to his life. I came back with water, and I was like, I'm not thinking of water, I'm thinking I have to leave this place, not water. Let's get that hat on his head so we can reduce the CO2, please. How's that passage to bring him out? Is it okay? It's fine, man. Is it? Yeah. The helmet supplies him with much needed oxygen. And now, he can finally talk to the crew. What's your name? Harrison, Harrison. Harrison? Yes, sir. Okay, Harrison. My name is Colby. Okay, and I'm gonna bring you home, okay? And the diver that's helping you now, his name is Nico. Okay, that's Nico, okay? What is your rank? I'm the cook, I'm the cook. You're the cook? Yes, they always survive. I felt so bad that I've lost all the guys that was there with me. I know within me that the only way I can get out of the boat, I must go through the water. So now you must just stay calm and you must listen to me, okay? And I'll tell you what to do. And we're gonna take you to the bell, okay? Don't worry, we're gonna bring you home, okay? Safe and sound. It was quite stressful for me because I didn't know exactly how I was gonna react. You don't know if you can swim. If he was halfway through the water and he started panicking, that would have been an uncontrolled situation completely. To me, that was quite stressful. Okay, how's that? Are you all right, Harrison? Are you comfortable? Okay, all right, let's go. Let's take him nice and sturdy, okay? Hold your umbilical, Harrison. Don't let go, okay? We're bringing you home. All right, Harrison, what are you doing? We're taking you up the stairs, and you're coming up onto the forecastle, okay? All right, just breathe nicely, Harrison. You're doing well. You're doing a very good job, my friend. And he told me, you're going to struggle, just hold the umbilical, so you can go with me. So I was just like, for my name. Okay, just hold your umbilical nice and tight. We're bringing you home nicely, okay? How are you feeling, Harrison? Okay, you must just respond to me and say, yes, I'm doing well, okay? Yeah, you must say, Roger, okay? All right. 
Okay, you're outside, okay? Okay, hold him there. Okay, Harrison, just stay there. I'm going to send the other diver to the bell. Okay. Taking him from the vessel into the bell where he's safe. There's about 10 meters through the water. And there's a, a line called the green rope. It's attached to the bell. In the open water, if Harrison panics and swims for the surface, the pressure change will kill him. The only way up is in the bell. Harrison has to reach it. Okay, can you see the green rope? Show him the green rope. Look for the green rope, Harrison. Harrison, hold the green rope. Yeah. Give him, take his hand. Hold his umbilical, pull him towards this. Oh, is he passed out? Yeah, I'll pull his umbilical. Pull him, pull him. I'll see you, I'll see you. Pull him. Open his onboard gas. Open all the onboard gases to the bellman. Harrison? Harrison? Daryl, pull him. The clock is ticking as second diver Daryl hauls Harrison to the bell by his umbilical. All right, stick his head in. Put his head in the bell. Once inside, Harrison regains consciousness. How are you feeling, Harrison? All right, very good. You scared me there. All right, you must say Roger when I'm talking to you. How are you in the bell, Harrison? Good job, my friend. Well done. You're a survivor. All right, guys, let's come home, okay? Harrison, back in the bell. Went with three, came back with four. <laughs> It was like someone had lifted all the bricks off me. <laughs> Huge relief. Yeah. Daryl, you've all done a good job. Thank you. I felt like I was on top of the world, though. It saved someone's life. Well done, Daryl. Pulled it back like a machine. <laughs> I just saw this body going. <laughs> all right, guys, well done. Well done. Let's come home, okay? I know I'm alive. Everybody was just celebrating for me. I was very, very happy. All 11 of Harrison's shipmates perished in the tragedy. Inspired by the brave men who saved his life, he trains to become a diver. I want to dive and I want to do it in the best I can. I want people to know that I'm not afraid of my fear. Because diving is good for me. But I believe someday inside of me that I will also rescue somebody through the same process. That is why I took the courage to become a diver. The Rocky Mountains in Western Canada are a rugged paradise for outdoor enthusiasts. It's the perfect destination for adventure vlogger Chase Davidson. Well, we'll see when we get to the top. Who films his hiking trips on mountain trails all over the country. Awesome, I love it. For his next trip on a backcountry trail, he's joined by old friend Corey Shooker. Hey, Corey, we just made it out to the lake of the Hanging Glacier Recreation Trail in British Columbia. This is the trailhead here. Boom. Here we go, overnight, 9K one way, got all our gear. We couldn't have asked for a better day. There's only a few clouds in the sky. It was probably around 85 degrees Fahrenheit and the snow was melting. You could sense that feeling. Yeah, it was just like the perfect day. Like... Yeah, hopefully everything works out. Let's see how the trail goes. So far, we're good? Good. All right, so we came to our first stream here. It's just a small one. This little guy here. Glaciers cling to 10,000 foot peaks all around Chase and Corey's trail, feeding meltwater into ice cold streams that cut across their path. Every trail guide warns of a particular stream known as Hell Roaring Creek.
we thought maybe this was the river crossing that everyone was warning us about. And it was easy. <laughs> Doing this. It's a case of mistaken identity. Hal Roaring Creek still lies ahead. We were probably about 20 minutes uh, away from getting to the river when we could first start hearing it. And it was just so loud. It's like a nonstop thunder. Apparently this trail uh, has a bridge that's only here in the summertime. So we figured if we came in the summertime, there'd be a bridge. Well, we're wrong. It was just exactly what the name implies, hell roaring. It was so powerful. The main bridge was broken, but then there was another one set up just down to the left. It didn't look very safe. If you were to fall there, you'd, you'd be dead. I think like me, he was nervous. I was like, we don't have to do this. If you want to turn back, there's going to be no hard feelings at all. But then Corey said, maybe we should just go for it. Apparently this trail uh, has a break. Well, we're off. Old friends Chase Davidson and Corey Shooker are on a backcountry hike in British Columbia. It looks like the end of the road since the bridge at Hell Roaring Creek has washed away. But there's a makeshift crossing and they've decided to give it a go. Yeah. Over 300 gallons of ice cold water thunders beneath the 20 foot crossing every second. If you fell off that bridge, you, your life was over. Yeah, that's all there is to it. Okay? Let's go slow. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. Alright buddy. The water was so powerful, it almost gave you a sense of vertigo. Within seconds, your feet are numb. Chase makes it across. Now, it's novice hiker Corey's turn. Hey, Corey, ready? One step at a time. He's like, I'm stuck. I was like, what are you stuck on? There's nothing here. Stay calm, buddy. 
Check. I gotta take your bag off. Get your arm out of that one first. Yeah. Check. You gotta get your arm out of this one now. You can't? Alright. Oh. The water was so powerful, it was pulling him back down into the rapids. Alright, I gotta pull you, buddy. I started unstrapping everything that the bungee cords were connected to. Come on! Come on! You okay? You okay? You want the ropes around you, the ropes around you. I don't want to go home. Okay. Okay, okay. Guys, I thought I was going to go down. Life was basically flashing before my eyes, but the water was freezing cold. I went right into shock. I just said to him, I want to go back across right now. I want to go home. I thought I had lost my best friend. Corey Shooker has barely survived the brush with death in the freezing rapids. As his body goes into shock, it's up to best friend Chase to get them both home alive. The sense of relief getting him out and knowing we were both okay, it was unimaginable. Okay. 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 I got you. I got you. That was so cold. Instantly gone right into shock. I don't want to do this thing. Okay, okay. I'm walking across by myself and you don't want to go across this right now in the state you're in. Make it. Just let's get out there. Go out there. Okay? Go buddy. I found the ledge to sit on and I sat there and cried. You have all these emotions running through your head and I'm freezing cold, it's hard for me to breathe. I had no energy. The shock makes Corey hyperventilate, exhaling more than he can inhale. As his brain is starved of oxygen, he becomes confused and irrational. We've just survived this whole crazy event. We're in the middle of nowhere, and we had to go back across that bridge that almost just took his life. I'm going back across the line, I'm gonna come back and get yours. I got clothes for you once we get back over. Hey, buddy. Just breathe, breathe in and out, okay? The only way home is back across Hell Roaring Creek. I was a lot more nervous knowing what happened the first time. was so heavy from the weight of the water that I had to take everything out. I went back and forth with all his gear six more times. 
made it as easy on him as I possibly could. We just had to get through this last hurdle. Corey, can you hear me? Okay, wait. Okay. When you come across, don't rely on this, this rope to hold you. You gotta rely on that one. Okay. I was scared. I was scared for my life. But I just got engaged. I don't want to leave my fiance back home. I couldn't think of anything else. Corey tethers himself to Chase, leaving only one rope as a handhold. Listen to me, listen. You have to push that one that way. Don't stress about it. Don't think about what just happened. Think something like that will happen to you until it happens. Hey. You okay? Let's see. All right. Hey, give me a hug, man. <laughs> this is the first time in our lives that we said we love each other, and from that moment on, we have no problem saying that to each other. Just one week later, they're back at it looking for adventure. I'm not gonna let me falling in a waterfall stop me, cross another bridge or go on another hike. I'm not gonna let that stop me. <laughs> it personifies the challenge of climbing. The summit of the Matterhorn was our focus no matter what. <laughs> Acute mountain sickness, in and out of consciousness. He was hurting. Sam Branson and his cousin Noah Devereaux have adventure in their DNA. Adventure is in the family blood. Sam's dad has done some serious adventuring in his life. They share their love for adventure by organizing the Strive Challenge, a weeks long charity event running, cycling, and hiking from London to Switzerland. Sam's dad. Billionaire entrepreneur Sir Richard Branson joins the boys right up to their final challenge. Climbing the iconic Matterhorn. London to the summit of the Matterhorn was our goal. It was very much the focus to get up there, you know, and, and give it a go no matter what. Straddling the border between Italy and Switzerland, the 14,700 foot Matterhorn towers over the landscape. Known as the King of the Alps, it's a mountain with a deadly reputation, having claimed 500 climbers' lives. Since 2005, I think 10 people a year have died on the mountain, which puts it into perspective. Sam keeps a video diary of the climb, starting in the dead of night. And uh, we are on the mountain and slowly waking our way up. Can see Joel here. Look at that. The amateur climbers are each led by a professional guide. Sam's guide is Kenton Cool. The Matterhorn, arguably the most iconic mountain in the world. It's got the steep ridges, and it's got quite foreboding faces. It personifies the challenge of, of climbing. So it's about to be sunrise on the mountain. Uh, absolutely stunning colors. Huge cliff face below me. 
It's very technical, it's getting more and more technical as you get higher up. So let's make sure we do this safely. It's a very dangerous mountain. It's steep, it's sustained, and it's exposed, really exposed in some places. People fall off. Uh, people do get hit by stone fall occasionally. So we're uh, taking a quick break on the mountain to put our crampons on because it's getting really snowy. It's very unusual for this time of year to be this snowy, which is why people have said the challenge is going to be tough. I'm starting to get good altitude now. It's really affecting the uh, lungs. As Sam and Kenton climb higher, the snow adds to the risk of falling and the increasing altitude makes it harder to breathe. Sam's clearly loving it. So we're starting to hit the steeper, more technical sections. As you can see behind me, this is just the most extortionately large drop. Um, slowly working our way along Sam's back. Exhausted. I would say it was more than three quarters of the way up. He started to notice something. So up high, sights like that definitely don't do wonders for the nerves. Oh, it's just the altitude. So oh, every two steps, it's like I got nauseous. And, It's absolutely spectacular, but you definitely have to keep your eye on the mountain because you look at things like that too much. Sam started to say that he maybe felt a bit dizzy, a little bit emotional. The altitude was starting to become a real factor. The lack of oxygen is causing Sam's body to shut down. gone from just being a little bit slow to being sort of slumping over a bit in the snow. <coughs> yeah. He was starting to suffer from acute mountain sickness. Now, altitude doesn't care. Very simply put, acute mountain sickness, it will kill you. Sam Branson and his cousin Noah are attempting to climb the iconic Matterhorn. Throw up high. I'm really exhausted. But Sam is struggling with the lack of oxygen, becoming dizzy and unsteady. These are classic signs of AMS, acute mountain sickness. Sam's sudden deterioration takes everybody by surprise. But reached the point that Sam wasn't steady on his feet and wasn't comfortable in himself very quickly. 14,000 feet up the mountain, Sam has reached a critical position. Above him is a sheer ice slope to the summit, while below lie thousands of feet of technical rock faces. A rope ties him and Kenton together for safety, but one slip could cause them both to fall. Sam suffered from acute mountain sickness and exhaustion, and I've deemed it too dangerous for myself to take him back down. It became obvious that Sam was in no condition to down climb the Matterhorn. It just would have been unsafe for Sam and for Kenton, frankly, to be tied to him. As down climbing with Sam is too dangerous, the only option is a helicopter rescue and the safest place on the mountain for an airlift is off the top. It's a clear blue day. There's no wind. The summit ridge, that's a clean lift, though. So I'm happy to be rescued off the top because of altitude sickness and no energy, weak. It's too dangerous to go down. Mixed of emotions. At the moment, all I want to do is get low down. So I say to Sam, right, come on, look at me. We're going to do this. We're going to galvanise. We're safely going to get up there 
and then call a chopper. Going higher risks deadly swelling in Sam's brain, but the summit is safer than the melting ice slopes they're on. Noah and the team aren't safe there either, so go ahead of Sam to the summit. The summit of the Matterhorn, whilst quite exposed, is actually flat. So you can rest far easier than you can on the side of the mountain. Sam stops filming and fights his way up. As he does, Dad Richard flies over to celebrate the team's success, unaware of Sam's situation below. It's okay, buddy. <laughs> With just the summit ridge left to climb, Kenton calls the rescue chopper. I am a British mountain guide on top of the Matterhorn. My client is unable to descend. Acute mountain sickness in and out of consciousness. Sam all but collapsed. He starts to like dry heave. Right, come on, we're gonna get up there. We're gonna get you something. So we, we start heading up. The helicopter on its way, they walk the ridge to the summit. Seven! Sam defies his dizziness, inches from the mountain's edge. spend your whole day clinging to a mountain, trying not to fall. And the idea of someone winching me off the mountain, hanging below a helicopter, was really freaking me out. A rescue technician is winched down to connect them to a cable. The helicopter comes in, click, clip, and Sam just grabbed me. And we literally got plucked off the mountain. Whoa! It was insane. Descending 9,000 feet to the valley floor, Sam's symptoms clear quickly. As soon as we went down, I started to feel better. I really do hope that he looks back on that day and he's proud about how deep he dug. Despite his ordeal, Sam still shares his love for adventure. Strive challenge is, um, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life. He even brings his dad along to climb the highest peak in Europe a few years later. When you start going out and pushing yourself and adventuring, you kind of get in your bones and you can't really stop. 